This video is in remembrance of Paul F. Stoll. I moved to Tulsa County when I was four years old. My father had to change jobs, or at least that's what I was told later on when I was old enough to wonder what led my parents to think that anyone would want to live out here. Tulsa County was one of the poorest countries in the states, if you didn't count the cluster of rich families that have massive estates up in the foothills, and it was one of the richest if you did count them. Most of the people you run across on the street either worked minimum wage jobs at a store or a restaurant in town, or they worked as help at one of the big homes. But that was just in the last 50 years. I guess that even people that could buy anything are getting desperate for places to land, because this clearly was not the first stop on anyone's list. After the last shaft shut down, the county began to eat itself, as people struggled to find work, to find food, to live. The murder rate, practically non-existent five years earlier, skyrocketed so that for nearly a decade, there averaged at least two murders a month. That's to say nothing of the arson and the insanity. More barns burned and more people wound up in the state sanitarium during these few years than in a century that had preceded it. People were scared and desperate, and... Things were getting worse with no end in sight. And then the fire happened. There are more than a couple of stories about how it started. Lightning during the biggest thunderstorm in 50 years. Moonshiners knocking over a lamp or one of those barn burners deciding to try something bigger. The end result was one of the largest wildfires in memory. It burned for three days straight consuming 2,000 acres of forest and a sizable portion of the town as well. After that, it all stopped. No more murder, no more fires. You would think it'd have gotten worse, given that the fire crippled the lumber industry in one shot, putting hundreds out of work or on half pay. But somehow it got better. People went back to living their lives, and the world moved on. Of course, I didn't know any of that when I was little. When I grew up enough to question things, I still had a good ten years before I even thought to look into the place's history. Those younger years, even now, I think of them as good years. Age tends to blur sharp edges of childhood memories, though, so who's to say? Maybe the good things I remember weren't that good. I know I have the bad ones right, though. The bad ones I remember just perfect. First time my father left. First time he came back. My first fight. The first time I was sent to the principal's office. The first time I lied. First time I took a life. At this point, it's all anecdotal, right? At this point, it isn't my life or even past reality. It's a story that I tell myself. I shuffle across a shrouded room and peer out the window that the past provides, knowing that it will only remind me of everything that I've lost. Yet, I keep coming back and looking out. Life is routine, after all. And all the time, even now, I hear that damn bitch whispering in my ear. The vinyl seat stuck to my legs, my constant shifting from side to side not helping a bit. The air conditioner wheezed out stale puffs of lukewarm air to mingle with the cigarette smoke that swirled through the station wagon as we rode eight miles between school and Sarah's house. The front passenger seat sat bare, all three of us packed out into the back bench seat, me on one side, Everett on the other, and Sarah in the middle. All of us rushing to talk at once as we chattered to Sarah's mom about what had happened that day. It's strange. But when my parents asked how my day went, I never gave them more than a non-committal grunt and a shrug. 
But with Roberta Park, all three of us would fight to spill our guts each and every day. I've wondered about that in the years since. Sarah always talked a lot. She always had a story to tell. Everett, though, he hardly talked to anyone except the two of us. I often think that he never had a friend before Sarah and I met him at the fair two years before. So, there we were. All three of us straining to top each other. To impress Sarah's mom with our stories. And why? I think it's because she actually listened. She actually cared about fickle interest in our miniature dramas. She kept track of our friends, our enemies. She knew what was cool. She realized that the highs and lows of our daily lives were no less developed, no less important, and no less real than those of adults. As with everyone, we were prisoners of the moment, unable to ever entirely escape the fact that we live minute by minute, with the troubles of the present always pressing closer than any thought of a better tomorrow. Sarah didn't have a father, and her mother was a nurse. She had to work all kinds of hours, and there were times where Sarah's mom would work the night shift for months in a row. During those times, Sarah would see her mother for less than half an hour a day except for her days off, and even then, it was catch-as-catch-can. Sarah would never say anything, but you could tell it bothered her. She'd get quiet, sometimes for days, and if you caught her in an unguarded moment, she could see lonely desperation in her eyes. It looked frightened me, attracting and repulsing me at the same time. I didn't fully understand why that was when I was younger, but now I think I know. I was seeing the same thoughts and feelings in her face that raced to my own mind and heart so often. So alone, and so desperate to connect, to matter to someone, to anyone to myself. Everett was really no different, of course. His family was perfect, loving, warm, and genuinely kind. The middle of five children, I think he felt kind of lost in the shuffle, though I never saw any of his family ignore him or mistreat him. For whatever reason, he had a sense of disconnect from them, from everybody, really. He was a spacey kid, for sure, yet... At the same time, he could be really smart and had a wicked sense of humor once he warmed up to you. That day that Sarah and I met him, he was holding up the line at the Hurricane, the premier attraction at the Tulsa County Fair. The ride was a whirling storm of metal arms and buckets that creaked and rattled ominously as it flung out its passenger's scream into the hot summer night. Everett was shifting foot to foot, a nervous habit I would come to learn, trying to decide if he wanted to get on or not. Come on, kid. Shit or get off the pot. The man taking tickets wore a stained baseball cap over a greasy black mullet that stood in sharp contrast to his bushy blonde mustache. Scratching his stomach, he studied the bell-speckled fat kid before him with heavy-lidded contempt before shifting his gaze to the teenage couple behind him. Keep it moving. Tickets. Tickets. He shot Everett a half-glance. Get out of the way, kid. Defeated, Everett began to shuffle away, his face growing red as he hitched his pants up in the back and stuffed his ticket into his shirt pocket. Before I knew it, I was out of the line and going after him. He looked up when I stepped in his path, his face startled and wary. Hi, I'm Dylan. What's your name? And then I noticed Sarah had followed me out of the line. I cocked a thumb toward her. This is Sarah. He looked around suspiciously, and I thought for a moment he might just bolt. But then he looked at Sarah again, and after a moment, back at me. Uh, I'm Everett. I nodded and smiled. Good to meet you. We are fixing to go in the hurricane, and we were looking for a third person to go with us. You interested? Everett looked confused, and then started shaking his head, his eyebrows drawing down in a scowl as he spoke. Look, funny joke, but why don't you guys just... Sarah stepped forward and put her hand on his shoulder. Hey, we're serious. Come, ride with us. 
He looked surprised again and began to smile uncertainly. You sure? I nodded. <laughs> sure as sure can be. Come on. I was 11 then. Nearly 13 on the day of the vinyl seats. Over 19 when we led Stellar Thompson to the cave. And yet, despite any friends I had later on, during none of those times would I have called myself extraordinarily sociable or outgoing. I wasn't really shy, but I didn't go out of my way to meet people either. I mean, few children are that sure of themselves, and I, I was no exception. Yet I reached out to Everett that night. Sarah and I both did. Looking back, I still find it all strange. As if it was not just some random act of kindness, but was instead just a step along the way towards... What? I don't think I know the real answer to that, even now, or maybe I'm just lying to myself again. I've grown very good at that. Back to Roberta Park's car, with all of us scrambling to tell her about our day. Everett and I were both trying to tell her about a fight we had seen that day at lunch, while Sarah was busy correcting all the gross exaggerations we kept throwing in. Her mother listened, laughing as she drove us to the house, occasionally asking a question to clarify a point or to get some background information on one of the characters in our story. And then he called him a name. Everett trailed off, his face growing red as he looked out the window. Sarah's mom grinned in the rearview mirror. What did he call him? I considered, reconsidered, and then burst out with it. He called him a little bitch. Sarah gasped and elbowed me hard in the arm, but her mother was cracking up like it was the best joke in the world. I was beaming with pride before she even spoke. She looked at me in the mirror. <laughs> Is that right? Well, it was... The truck hit our car slightly left of head-on, with enough force to spin us around three and a half times before the back of the station wagon slammed into a tree twenty feet off the road. For a few moments, everything was chaos and screaming, surreal in its sudden intensity. Then, then everything was quiet. The only sounds were the quiet ticking of the dead engine and Everett's soft sobbing. The front windshield was white with spiderwebbed glass, and the dash didn't look quite right, but otherwise everything seemed okay. I wasn't hurt at all except for where the seatbelt had held me in, and that bruise went away in a few days. Sarah and Everett were the same, with Everett's tears coming from shock and fear rather than any real pain. When I looked at the front seat, however, I saw that Sarah's mother was slumped over and unmoving. Sarah followed my gaze, started screaming, fighting with her seatbelt in an attempt to get close. I popped my own free and eased forward to look at the woman that we all loved. My first thought was that she was dead. Her face was covered in blood from a large cut on her forehead. I later learned it had come from her head striking the steering wheel. Then I saw her short, shallow breaths and I yelled that she was alive. Sarah was beside me the next second and she started trying to wake her mother up, gently stroking the woman's hair. I looked down and saw something that confused me for a moment before understanding set in and my stomach clenched into a tight ball of ice. The dash had been pushed in at least two feet, Roberta Park's legs disappearing beneath it just below the knees. My mind raced for what I should do or say, how I could help, how I could keep Sarah from ever seeing or knowing something like this. And then I heard the sirens approaching. Sarah's mother was in the hospital for nearly two months, with Sarah staying two towns away with her grandmother most of the time until the woman came home. By the end of that summer, Roberta Parks could walk short distances with a walker, but she was in constant pain. Sarah told me once that she would wake up in the night and hear her mother crying from the pain. 
I always think about that if I start thinking too harshly of Sarah's part and what we did later. More than any of us, she had her reasons. Just like us, she didn't know what she was asking for. Summer is about freewheeling fun, lazing about in the bliss of no schedule and no rules. At least that's what it's about when you're sitting in a classroom daydreaming about it. When you're in the middle of it, summer is often about hot, sticky boredom for long stretches of time as you try to find something worthwhile to do with the pooled, meager resources of three barely teen teenagers. Of course, that's what leads to some of your best childhood experiences, I think. In the face of that desperation, you either start a project, get in trouble, or embark on a quest. For some, the quest is making money for the perfect bike, or training all summer so you can make first string in the fall. For others, it was making the world's greatest independent film with your parents' camcorder, or making your crush turn into something more. For the three of us, that summer was about surviving. We only got to see Sarah at once every couple of weekends, and even then it was usually only for a few hours. Between those visits, Effort and I have spent most of our time playing board games or just walking around with no real destination or purpose in mind. We still enjoyed hanging out together, but it wasn't the same without her there to connect us. Beyond that, we were scared to death that her mother might die or be crippled. We never talked about it, but it hung in the air all the time, Sarah's absence acting as a constant reminder. We were only two weeks from school back when Sarah's mother came and Sarah came back to us. For the first couple of days, we just gloried in being back together, but soon enough that old familiar restlessness began to set in. Sarah had met us over at Everett's house, and we were all munching on Rice Krispie treats that his mother had brought out for us on the back porch, sitting in companionable silence as we stared out at the slowly warming Tuesday morning. That's when Everett said it. You guys ever heard of Mystery Cave? We both turned to look at Everett with mild interest, just the name already piquing our curiosity. He smiled slightly and nodded. Keith was telling me about it a few days ago. He says that it's in the woods somewhere north of town, about a mile off of an old lumber road up there. I turned to look at him more squarely. So, what is it? Everett swallowed and blushed slightly. Well, apparently it's an old myth that if you go to the cave, it'll answer your questions. It can even predict the future. Sarah laughed. <laughs> oh, really? How does it do that? Everett blushed harder and shrugged. <laughs> Never mind. It's just a stupid story. Sarah frowned, shook her head. No, tell us. We want to hear. He looked between the two of us, chewing a bite of Rice Krispie for a moment before continuing on. Well, you're supposed to write your question on a piece of paper and tie it around a rock. Then you toss into the cave and leave. You go back the next day and the rock will be back outside with the answer tied to it. Even though I knew it was impossible, I felt myself getting excited. So, who writes the answers? Nobody knows. He laughed nervously. I guess that's why it's called Mystery Cave, huh? Sarah put her plate down and leaned forward. Well, hasn't anyone ever hidden and watched who brings the answers out? Everett shook his head. No, I asked Keith that. He said nobody will stay out there at night because anyone that's ever tried has disappeared. At this point, my mind was racing. Logically, I was old enough to know that there couldn't be anything to it. At most, a bunch of other bored kids might be writing the answers to screw with anyone stupid enough to actually try it. But probably not even that. 
On the other hand, Keith was by far the nicer of the Everett's two older brothers, and he never struck me as the kind of guy that would mess with his little brother for the hell of it. Besides, it was something to do. Sarah was still questioning Everett when I broke in. Let's go check it out. There are few images more overused to call up nostalgia for one's childhood than the image of a group of best friends pedaling along a bright summer day laughing or joking together. If it's in a movie, then the odds are better than even that a 50s or 60s song will be bopping along in the background to further convey what an idyllic and innocent time it really is. It started raining ten minutes before we found the lumber road. We all had bikes, true enough, but the road was uneven and crooked, too treacherous in the rain for us to ride down without risking our necks. Right on cue, Everett started complaining about how we should turn around and come back later. Sarah squinted at him through the steadily increasing drizzle. What? Are you kidding? We're out here now. It took nearly an hour, and do you think we'll be any drier if we go back than if we stay? She stared at him with this look she could give that made you feel all of five years old. But, I nudged his shoulder. No buts, short stuff. What is wet, right? Let's find the cave. He nodded begrudgingly, and we stared down the road. After a quarter mile, shrubs and scrub pines had narrowed the way to barely a path, and soon this turned into an almost invisible trail. We left our bikes behind and went on, wet leaves slapping me in the face as we moved deeper into the woods. Sarah was in the lead, as was so often the case in those days, and Everett stayed in the back, tripping over the roots that I didn't remember to point out to him. It seemed like we walked for hours, but I know it wasn't nearly that long. Later, the trips to the cave would seem to come all too quickly. I ran into Sarah's back when she stopped suddenly and half-muttered, shit, barely audible above the rain pattern and the tree sounds. Looking past her, I saw that the trail had run out. In front of us were random bushes and a cluster of sweet gum trees. There was no sign of any way to go, except for back. Well, fuck. Sarah punched me in the arm with a frown. Don't curse. I started. But you said... I was just surprised, and besides, you were about to shove me over. I rolled my eyes, but didn't say anything else. Looking around, I sighed. Any direction was as good as another, which meant they all led to nothing. Sarah looked at me expectantly, as if I was supposed to show them the way. I had no clue. I was about to suggest we give up and go back to Everett's house when he spoke for the first time. I turned to look at him and saw that he was squinting off in the distance to our right. I followed his gaze, but still didn't see anything. Sarah asked him what he had said, but... I already knew when he repeated it. I see the cave. The trees and bushes fell away as we approached, replaced by grass and then rocky hard scrabble that ended at a granite lip sloping down to the mouth of the cave itself. The bowl-shaped concavity that surrounded the cave's opening was deep enough that the black opening was all but obscure from most angles, and I remember wondering for a moment how Everett had managed to see it in the first place. But that was quickly pushed aside by the excitement of discovery. Standing at the precipice of fulfilling our grand quest for the day, my best and, if I was honest, only friends standing beside me as we peered down into the dark depths of the mystery cave. Even then, I think we picked up on something different in that place. It was almost as if we had crossed over some invisible line where the air became slightly electric and there was a pulse of power all around. That pulse was simultaneously inferior and as concrete as our own heartbeats, sending out a thrum like being too close to an energy plant or power lines. But the strangeness of this place only added to the charm of it all. We stood there for a long time on the edge of that stony lip, looking down into nothingness, 
not saying a word. After a number of minutes, Sarah broke the silence. Hey, look at that. We turned to where she was pointing and saw a dust devil whirling along in the dirt a few feet to our left. The tiny tornado of dirt hitched this way and that, coming towards us for a moment before drifting off again. A few seconds later, it moved toward the trees, disappearing into the dark of the woods. Huh. That was pretty cool. I looked down at Everett and grinned, nodding. Then, turning back to the cave, I elbowed him in the side. So you gonna go in there or what? I heard him make a choking sound, which he tried to cover with nervous laughter. <laughs> yeah, not likely. I told you, people have disappeared out here. Plus, I'm not too keen on getting bit by a snake. I grinned and nodded. Just checking, man. Never hurts to check. I turned to Sarah. You ready to do it? She nodded and began to fish in her pockets for the items she'd taken from Everett's house before we'd left that morning. I looked at him again. So we just write a question down, tie it around a rock, then toss the rock in? That's it? Everett nodded, started to blush. Yeah, that's it. That's what Keith said anyway. Sarah had given us all pencils and scraps of paper by that point, so I stepped off a few paces to write my question down, all of us separating without saying a word or making a joke. I looked around at Sarah and Everett as I smoothed the paper on my palm. Their expressions were serious and intense, and I knew that if I looked at my reflection I would see the same expression there. Whatever this had started out as, we weren't treating this as a joke any longer. It was serious business, meant to be taken seriously. Which meant serious questions. That was when I realized I had totally forgotten to think of what question I actually wanted to ask. I stared at the scrap of notebook paper, wondering what was important enough. My boy's pride welling in to squelch questions that could be embarrassing if read by someone else. Looking up again, I saw that Sarah and Everett were already writing, putting more pressure on me to get it right and make it quick. An idea came to me, and I jotted it down quick. Will my parents ever stop making each other so sad? It was a silly, childish question, and I felt a rush of embarrassment as I scribbled it down, shielding the paper from the continued drizzle but it was something that was important to me at the time. My father had come back again the night before, stone sober, as he always was on his first night's back. The second he walked in, you could feel the resentment crackling off him like static electricity, sending out a dull hum that sent me past with hurried, perfectionary hugs I escaped my room. They yelled a long time but then that was nothing new either. And then I changed my mind. I still don't know why I did it, whether it was just a random act or something of deeper significance. Either way, I tore off the portion of the paper that bore my question, stuffing it into my pocket as I looked around to make sure no one was watching. I folded my blank paper once and began looking for a rock to tie it around. I paused for a moment, questioning whether I should throw a rock with no question, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd made the right choice. I turned my mind back to the task at hand, picking out a smooth rock and pressing the wrinkled paper to its cool, wet surface. I dried it off on my shirt as best I could, but I was still afraid the paper would soak through and give up its secret. Then I noticed that Sarah was walking over, so I tied it and stood up, giving her a grin as I brushed the wet grass off my pants. So, what'd you write? She rolled her eyes at me. <laughs> I can't tell. Might not get an answer if I do. She returned my smile. You ready? 
Everett's starting to sneeze. He was shivering when we drew close to the rim again, his expression miserable as he clasped his rock to his stomach. Can we do this and get home? I'm freezing. I laughed and nodded. Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. It'll be dark if we don't hurry. Everett blanched at that and turned toward the cave, eyeing it warily. I threw my rock in first, right into the middle of the cave's black mouth. I heard it hit stone and bounce once before fading into the dark. Sarah's was next, and then Everett's, and it was done. Everett looked ready to bolt, but I stopped both of them. Guys, whatever happens next, let's keep this place secret, okay? This is our place. It'll be a secret just for us. Everett nodded solemnly, but after giving a brief smile, Sarah nodded as well, her eyes serious as she looked past us to the cave below. We were quiet on the way back to Everett's. No jokes or complaints about the rain or how long it was taking to get back. When we got there, Everett's mother fussed over us for nearly an hour, making us all take hot showers and change into borrowed dried clothes. She'd been worried about us, and she wanted to yell at us too, I think, but she was a gentle person, a good person. And if it was in her nature to have the urge to yell, it was also in her nature to resist that urge. So we spent an uneventful hour getting dry and eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, thinking about very little aside from mundane chit-chat. When the storm finally let up, Sarah and I left with little more than an absent goodbye and an agreement that we'd go back to that cave together the next morning. I don't think it's because we were thinking about our questions or even because we were wondering what the answers would be. We considered both off and on to be sure, but that wasn't the real question for the silence. It was because we felt how things were at the cave. We all knew that something was different there. It made us question that it might be more than a legend or a practical joke. That it might actually be real. And if it was real, if it was really true, just... What did that mean? The next morning I woke up with the mild acceptance and complacency of someone that has a job before them that is neither good nor bad, but simply must be done. I remember a foggy moment of surprise at that as I groggily swung my feet to the floor, dimly wondering why there was no Christmas morning flush of excitement or nervous twisting in my stomach. Instead, I very calmly washed my face and dressed, calling over to Everett's before heading over to find him and Sarah sitting on the steps waiting. I felt a twinge of jealousy seeing them sitting together on the steps, even though I knew that Sarah lived ten minutes closer to Everett's house than I did. They greeted me with smiles when I walked up, but their faces and voices carried the same muted quality that I felt in my own thoughts and feelings. We didn't goof around or waste any time that morning, but simply headed out to the cave with hardly another word. It was still early but the air was already warm, with the cloudless blue sky offering no memories of the storm of the night before. We made better time than before, and we had no problem finding our way back to the clearing in the cave. As we broke through the tree line, Sarah let out a gasp. Neither Everett or I had to ask why. Along the edge of the rocky lip, three rocks, our rocks, were lined up neatly, the pieces of paper we had left tied around them. Even from a distance I could spot mine and tell that it was tied differently than the way I had done it. My heart started thudding in my chest as I looked over to Sarah and Everett. Sarah looked nervous, but Everett was white as a ghost, his eyes jittering in a way I didn't like as his gaze shifted back and forth between my eyes and the line of rocks twenty feet away. 
I reached down and gave his shoulder a squeeze and then an awkward light punch. Hey, this will be cool, right? This is what we wanted. See if it worked. He nodded weakly at me, forcing a grin. Yeah, I know. It'll be cool. I nodded back at him. All right, then. Let's go get our answers. I shot Sarah a look and smiled. Sarah first. Nuh-uh. All at the same time, buddy boy. I shrugged back, then nodded. The three of us walking shoulder to shoulder like soldiers, marching in a battle. I bent down and picked up my rock with both hands, holding it carefully as though it was fragile. I thought about stepping back, retreating to the same spot that I'd written my unasked question, but I decided against it. We all stood together, hugging loose the neat little bows that had been tied when the papers had been put back against the cool surface of the rocks. Pulling the paper from the rock, I folded it slightly without being obvious, intent on not letting the others see that my paper was blank. That was when I noticed it wasn't. I could see the ragged top edge where I'd torn off my question and stuffed it into my pocket, and if I hadn't been certain that was my paper before, I knew it was now. It was slightly dirtier than when I'd last seen it, but the paper was still legible. I looked at the word written there, wondering at it, studying the handwriting in an absent kind of way as my mind worked. The word was written in black ink, the handwriting both spidery and elegant at the same time, frail lines woven together confidently to form something more. Puffing out of breath, I forced myself to focus and read the word again. Eventually... It was then that I noticed that Sarah was crying. I turned toward her to see that Everett had his arm around her, making meager, comforting noises. I felt jealousy twist in my belly again, but pushed it aside as I asked her what was wrong. She looked up at me, seeing her like that. It felt as though my chest might cave in at any moment. I asked her again what was wrong. She wiped her eyes as she looked away. Nothing. It's great. At least if it's not some stupid joke, right? But it probably is, right? I glanced down at the piece of paper she was holding before glancing back up at her. What did you ask? Her head jerked back and she began shaking her head as she crumpled the paper in her hand. No, uh I'm not telling. It might not come true if I tell. Okay. Everett let out a snort that swiftly turned into a grin. <laughs> well, I can tell you that mine isn't going to come true. Sarah sniffled and looked back at him with a slight smile. What is it? Well, I asked... What's the most important thing I'll do in my life? The answer was, save lives. He laughed, his pale skin turning red. <laughs> Not exactly the heroic type, you know? I frowned at him as I shook my head. That's not true. Besides, that can mean a lot of things. Maybe you'll grow up to be a firefighter, or a cop, or a doctor or something, Sarah added, poking Everett in the chest. You never know. I personally thought that a doctor might be a stretch for Everett. He was far from stupid, but he had trouble focusing on anything for more than a minute or two. And to hear him tell it, his grades were always right on the borderline of getting him in trouble at home. Everett blushed harder and nodded, looking down at the cave for a moment before taking a step back. His gaze sank to the ground in front of him, as he asked the question that we had all been thinking since we saw the three rocks waiting for us in a neat little row. So, who do you think's doing this? Answering the questions, I mean. 
Sarah started to say something, but I cut in. Let's wait to talk about that. Away from here. They both fell silent, and we all cast another glance at the black hole below us before moving back to the edge of the clearing. I was glancing around to make sure that we took the right path back out when I heard Sarah call out. Hey, guys, come over here. I found something. In retrospect, I usually feel sure that it wouldn't have changed anything if Sarah had never seen that fourth rock half hidden in a clump of weeds. Most of the time, I'm as sure as I can be. But every now and then, doubt will set in, and it's at those times that I wonder if finding that rock and whatever happened after wasn't what gave us that final push from curiosity to real belief, giving the mystery real power over us. Regardless, Sarah did find the rock, and we came running when she called, our nerves all a bit on edge and our minds filled with any number of misfortunes that were about to befall us. It was a relief when I saw that Sarah was only pointing at another rock with a note lying next to it, the frayed and broken green dental floss used to tie the paper to the rock in such a wet mess to one side of the rock's surface. I almost smiled. But then I realized what that meant. Someone else had asked the cave a question, too. Read it already! Everett's voice had the reedy whine that let me know he was scared. Patting him on the shoulder, I looked at the paper as Sarah spread it flat on her palm. First, the question scrawled in big, feminine loops and curls in bright blue ink. When will I die? I paused at that, momentarily reflecting how odd a question that was for someone to ask. But then the familiar black handwriting below the question caught my eye. This Thursday. Banner Park used to have swarms of kids during the summer, or so I've heard. At one time it had the only baseball field in town, so I'm sure it was popular enough in its day. But since then, the new pair of fields have been built closer into town at the recreation department, and most things on the north side of town had fallen away to varying degrees, fading as they were replaced by newer businesses and restaurants elsewhere. That being said park wasn't too bad. Overgrown to be sure, and probably home to more snakes than any of us wanted to think about, but there were worse places to sit for a moment and gather our thoughts. We had all read what was written on that paper, but as soon as Sarah placed it and the accompanying rock back into the grass, we silently began making our way out of the woods. We didn't run, but we moved quick and steady, walking as if a wild dog stepped at our heels, waiting for us to take a break so we could take us to the ground. I breathed easier when we broke the tree line, and easier still when we settled onto the splintered wood bench in the dugout out of Banners Park weed-choked field. Looking out what I thought had probably once been the pitcher's mound, I forced myself to start. So... She asked when she was going to die. I saw Everett nod out of the corner of my eye. And the cave told her Thursday. Tomorrow. Sarah spoke up, shaking her head. We don't know that. It could have been there for weeks. I noticed that her first objection wasn't that it wasn't true, but only that could have already happened. I let it pass and went on to state the obvious. It was boring yesterday. That paper hadn't been wet, so that means it was put out today. Had to have been. Everett broke in. Do you think it'll really happen? When I looked at him, his eyes had grown big as saucers, and I laughed in spite of myself. (laughs) Calm down, man. 
I don't know. Maybe it's just a bunch of kids playing a joke. It's not a joke. Sarah was yelling, halfway to standing before she caught herself and sat back down, her voice softer. We all know there's something to it, don't we? Don't you both feel like it's not just a joke? We both nodded, all three of us falling silent for several minutes before Everett stood back up and walked to the rusted pole that served as half the doorway to the dugout. He looked back at us, his face dark. We need to find out who this is. Help them. How are we going to find out who it is? It looked like a girl's handwriting, and it was probably someone around our age, but maybe not even that. That's a lot of people. But, I raised my hand to continue. And even if we did find them, what could we do? We don't know how they'll die any more than they do. And what if they're supposed to die? If that is what is meant to happen. Sarah gave my arm a shove. You think some poor girl our age is just supposed to die? I frowned at her and shrugged. Sure, maybe, I, I don't know. But it doesn't matter anyway because we don't know who it is and we don't have any way of finding out. All we can do is wait and see. Everett started to say something else, but in the end, he just nodded and looked away. We walked back to our side of town together, the conversation slowly picking up again as we went. We talked about what to do with the rest of our afternoon and with the rest of our fleeting summer days. We didn't talk about the cave or about the girl that we all believed was about to die. Autumn Lester loved to dance. She had taken her first ballet lesson at four and had fallen madly, passionately in love, though she didn't realize it at the time. Some people danced for attention or because they had some unrealistic dream of being rich and famous. She knew plenty of girls like that, and she could understand both motivations. But for Autumn, it only felt like she was really and truly her when she was moving from position to position, flowing from one movement to the next. It was the only time she felt real. She would practice for hours during school, but during the summers, she had the freedom to really make progress. She had a state dance competition in December, and she knew that she had a strong chance at coming in first this time. She didn't care much about winning, but according to Miss Eccles, it would give her chances of getting a scholarship for college a really big boost. Miss Eccles had encouraged her since junior high, allowing her to use the high school's gym every morning to practice her routines. She had even given the girl a key to let herself in and out, even though Autumn was pretty sure that had to be against the rules. Still, Autumn was responsible, and she was proud that Miss Eccles knew she could trust her. This morning wasn't going well. She kept missing her changes, and her mind was too preoccupied for her focus on really correcting the mistakes she kept making. Her father had been diagnosed with prostate cancer last week, and then yesterday happened. After three hours, she gave up, heading to the locker room for a shower. The girl's showers consisted of opposing walls with five shower heads, each and two privacy showers along the adjoining third wall. The privacy showers consisted of two seven-foot steel walls and a floor-length steel door with a bolt on the inside. It always reminded her of something from a prison movie, but she always went to them, even when she was the only one around. She stripped, entered the shower, shutting the door, and finally getting the bolt shut home after nearly a minute of tugging. Starting the shower up, she yelped as the cold water hit her, dancing around on her tiptoes until it warmed. She was halfway through washing her hair when she learned that the boiler's thermostat had shorted out. Later, the fire marshal would make the comment that even with the older boilers, the chance of a short out causing the water to heat instead of cool were a thousand to one easy. But when the thermostat went two days earlier, 
the boiler's temperature had started rising, and it had continued to do so until the fire department shut it off. The gym's water ran off the main building, and there were nearly a hundred yards of warm and cold water between the boiler room and the shower where Autumn was singing a song she'd been hearing on the radio all summer as she tried to keep her mind on cheerful things. It took nearly four minutes for the boiler's water to hit her. But when it did, it was nearly 300 degrees. There was a moment of stunned confusion as she felt her scalp begin to tingle and blister. And she began to scream. If it had hurt a little less, or if she had been slightly less scared, she might have gotten the door open and escaped with few scars. As it was, she only tried to move the bolts for a handful of seconds before the pain eliminated all reason. Thirty seconds in, her screams had been replaced with raw, warbling cries that tried for words and failed. They didn't find her until mid-afternoon, hours after her question had been answered. Death isn't real for a child, at least not for the lucky ones. Even at 13, after seeing how close Sarah's mom had come to death, none of us really feared death in a tangible way. It was an abstract concept that failed to signify, and when we heard about Autumn, it didn't really register. Yes, we were sad. We were sad for her and her family as well, even though Everett and I had never met her and Sarah had heard that she was a stuck-up bitch. But in the end, those feelings were just window dressing for what truly lay in our hearts. Excitement. Because we now knew it was real. From that belief sprang an understanding between the three of us, a, a pact. We never spoke of it in those early days, but we all knew. We were going to keep using the cave. We would only go as a group and we'd never tell anyone else, but we'd go back. And we did. As fall came on, we began caught up in the day-to-day -day routine of school and hanging out together. I tried out for junior varsity football and made the first string, but I quit after a week of practices out of boredom. While it didn't seem strange at the time, in retrospect, I wonder at the fact that we didn't visit the cave more often in those first few months. Between that first time in mid-August and Thanksgiving vacation, we only went three times. In the end, I think the reason we didn't go more is because we knew it wasn't a joke and it wasn't a toy. We knew it was real and that it was serious, so we only went when we all had serious questions to ask. We never talked about each other's questions after that first time. We didn't even talk about the cave itself during those first months. Anything can be accepted into your life given enough time. Our trips into the North Woods every month or so seemed as natural as going downtown for a matinee on a Saturday afternoon. No, that's that's another lie. We all knew it was off. We, we fucking knew, but we were too stupid or selfish to care doesn't matter now. Back to those first ones. My second through fourth questions were as follows. Will I be successful when I'm grown? The answer, you will accomplish much. Will the three of us always be friends? The answer, you'll all be connected as long as you live. And then, my face hot as I tied to a heavy chunk of granite. Will Sarah ever love me? And the answer, yes. In time, she will. That night, I could barely sleep, my head spinning and my stomach churning. Next day was Thanksgiving, and it would be that afternoon before the three of us got together. I felt sure that I wouldn't know what to do or how to act around her. Intellectually, I knew nothing had really changed, but it didn't matter. 
not that night. I listened to the wind outside my window, shadows shifting across my ceiling as I thought about the cave, silently thanking and praising whoever had made me so happy. The next day was uneventful, and after a few minutes of awkwardness, I fell into my old routines with Sarah and Everett. This strange and wonderful secret had grown up between the three of us, coiling its vines around our arms and legs, plunging its roots deep into our minds and our hearts. It grew bigger as the months passed and the seasons changed, binding us closer to each other and to itself. Yet, at the same time, it was invisible to us, or nearly so. Our lives weren't so different now that they had been before, not really. On the surface, we were just like anyone else, and the cave and the questions were just something that happened in our lives. That's the way it was for nearly three years. We were all juniors in high school now, and it's true what they say. The more things change, the more they stay the same. I was still the most outgoing of our group, the most popular. Sarah was the smartest, well on her way to winning several state scholarships, including one for track. Everett was still the kindest, and thus the most easily preyed upon. Yet, at the same time, Everett had changed the most out of all of us. The physical changes were the most noticeable. He'd shot up to well over six feet and had taken to working out every morning by himself, even though he had no interest in sports. Girls had started noticing him in spite of himself, but he still rarely dated. Not that I was surprised he was in love with Sarah, after all. Who could blame him, really? It wasn't anything that I hadn't known, or at least suspected for a long time. One afternoon during spring break, he came to me, his idiotic cocker spaniel falling behind him with a gleeful bounce as he walked up to where I was laying in the hammock, taking a break from cutting the grass. I raised my eyebrows he approached, already knowing that something was wrong. We weren't supposed to meet up for another three hours. Hey, what's up, man? You're a little early, aren't you? He nodded, his eyes downcast, and his hands jammed into his pockets as he told Sandy to quit jumping up on the side of the hammock. Ah, she's fine. What's up? Something wrong? I saw him swallow, stalling for time. I wanted to scream at him to get it out, whatever it was. Just stop being a coward and say it. And then he did. I love Sarah. I almost laughed, but managed to resist just barely. Yeah, me too. She's the shit. He shook his head, his big mop of brown hair swishing from side to side like a sheepdog. Made him look stupid. No, that's not what I meant. I'm in love with her. I felt something crawl in my stomach but pushed it down. I had nothing to worry about. The cave had already told me all I needed to hear. I did just humor him. Poor guy couldn't help it. I don't know what to say about that, man. We're all so close. I mean, she never dates anybody for too long, but I guess it makes sense that one of us might end up with her, but... At that point, I should have left it alone, but I couldn't help but twist the knife a little, giving it a morbid curiosity. But did you ask her if she feels the same way? He nodded, and now he did look up, if only for a moment. I could see tears shining in his eyes, and I felt as though I'd been hit in the chest. Next to Sarah, Everett was my best friend. I should be making him feel better, not making it all worse, but now it was done. I had to bring the subject to a close and then never bring it up again. Looking out into the yard, I asked, So, what did she say? Shh. She said she loves me too. In love, I mean. She said she's in... In love with me too. I 
I know I didn't speak for at least 30 seconds. I couldn't ask him to repeat and be too obvious, and I knew what he had said. But still, I had to have misheard it, or he was wrong, or this was all a nightmare, or, or something. Only I knew none of that was true. That was why he was so upset, because he knew it was true, and he knew what it would mean to me. We'd never talked about it, but he knew how I felt about her, and he was crying for me. Crying. When I pulled it together enough, I turned back to him and gave him a smile that I knew had to look more like a grimace. Yet, he bought it, or pretended to, and he smiled back at me through his tears. Well, what can I say? Big news, I guess. Congratulations to both of you. There were a million questions I wanted to ask, knowing I didn't want the answer to any of them. When had they fallen in love? Had they fucked yet? Did they lay together naked and laughing, making fun of me? Why was any of this happening in the first place? How? This wasn't the way it was supposed to be. But I knew better than to ask anything. And I knew that none of it mattered. My anger was already being replaced by a confused numbness washing out the world around me. Everett looked worried but said nothing for several seconds before calling Sandy back over from where she was exploring the bushes at the edge of the backyard. Well, I'll let you get back to stuff. Just wanted to let you know. You're my best friend, so I wanted to share the good news. That was a damn lie. He was coming to give me his fucking condolences. I nodded and grunted in response. Are we still on for this afternoon? Three of us fishing? I nodded again, forcing myself to speak. Sure thing, man. Would miss it. Later. We'd been planning on going fishing since the previous weekend. One of those random things that you practically never do, but that suddenly seems like the best idea in the world. And it had been at the time. When Sarah suggested it, Everett and I had been excited, but that was a week before. A week ago, there weren't awkward silences when the three of us were together. A week ago, I wasn't constantly gritting my teeth to keep from screaming while Sarah looked uncomfortable and Everett looked worried. A week ago, images of them together, laughing, fucking, hiding from me, weren't flashing through my head like an obscene shutter-stop light show. We hung around, catching little and staring at nothing, avoiding each other's gaze. I knew that they had already talked about it. He'd probably broke his neck running to tell her all about it. Then they'd hugged, agreed that they would give me the time that I needed to get used to it, because they both knew how I felt, because they wanted to spare my feelings. <sighs> it made me want to vomit. It was starting to get dark when we left the pond, only about a mile and a half southwest of Mystery Cave. The awkwardness of the whole thing became more apparent with each hour that passed in near silence. Both Everett and I had both gotten cars in the last few months, but Sarah had suddenly decided that we should ride our bikes down anyway. As we trudged down the dirt road that led to where our bikes lay hidden in the bushes, I found myself hating both of them. Not just out of jealousy, but because they'd ruined something so precious. I had a lot of friends at school, and I did fine with other girls, but none of it actually mattered to me. They were all just part of what I had to do to make it through the day. A means of social lubrication and passing the time that made the pill of daily life a little easier to swallow. But this. What I had with Sarah and Everett was different. As much as I picked on him at times, Everett was my best friend, and Sarah... I loved her so goddamn much, even then. They were the only ones I felt safe to be myself around, with all the bullshit posturing and games of high school. They were what made my life real, and gave it something approaching a meaning. And they'd spoiled it all. 
When we parted ways, Sarah went with Everett even though her house was closer going my way. I saw him cast a guilty glance my way and then he went off into the twilight. I decided right then and there what I would do. I'd refuse to see them or talk to either of them. I wouldn't explain myself and I wouldn't get into any conversations about what was going on with them, but they'd know what it was all about. Then they'd either prove themselves to be loyal, good friends, and break off their stupid romance, or they'd stay together in spite of losing me and show themselves to be the true traitors they were. It was a good plan, even if it was going to be hard to do. But I was determined, and I vowed that I wouldn't see either of them again until they had fixed what they had done. <sighs> Didn't work out that way. I was half asleep when I heard something hit my bedroom window. I jerked up, looking around confusedly for a second before my gaze settled on the window that looked out onto our backyard. A moment later, another pebble hit the window. I knew who it had to be, as Everett was the only one who had ever done that, and even he had not done it for a couple of years or more. Still, I had already decided that I wasn't going to talk to either of them. I wouldn't cave in now. Another pebble, tap thump, as it hit the glass, then bounced away as down the shingles below. I looked at the clock. 1.53 a.m. Something wasn't right. Even if Everett wanted to pour his heart out about Sarah, he wouldn't come this late to do it. He was too terrified of his parents catching him out that late. Cursing myself, I threw back the covers and went to the window, opening it just before he hurled another rock from the yard below. One look at him and I knew that something bad had happened. I whisper hissed, I'll be right down, and closed the window back. My stomach churning, I pulled on my jeans and shoes, sneaking quietly down to the kitchen's back door and finding Everett waiting there. Even in the weak illumination of the moonlight, I could tell that he was pale and terrified. When he spoke, I could tell he'd been crying as well. What is it? What's going on? He shook his head. I... I need to show you. Come on. Gone was the weak, placating tone of this afternoon. For the moment, something had grown so large in Everett's vision that our little melodrama had dropped from view. I've got my car. I'll drive. I just nodded and followed him, already getting caught up in the state of dead panic that seemed to be baking off of Everett like a fever. We drove fast, going back to his house, faster than usual for him, and never spoke during the ride. When we got out, Everett looked at me, his eyes still too wide and glassy as he beckoned me to follow. We went around to the back of the house, carefully easing open the fence gate to get into the backyard. It closed softly behind me, and when I turned back around, I saw Sandy for the first time. The dog lay fifteen feet away, her body half on and half off a brick patio that led out from the house's living room glass sliding doors. She'd been gutted. Although that seems like far too clean and precise a term for what had been done to her. I'd gone deer hunting with my uncle the previous fall, and I'd seen him field dress a deer once, using a long, sharp knife to cut a narrow slit of the animal's belly. This was different. I had a flash of a game show I'd watched once where a family had to dig around in a pie until they found the key to their new car. They'd plunge their hands through the crust over and over, bringing out fistfuls of blackberries every time before digging in again. I stifled a gag, realizing for the first time that Everett was talking. So I came out to see if she was feeling better, and that's, that's when I found her like this. I 
tore my eyes away from the dog's remains to stare at Everett. I didn't know what to say. Then a dark thought bubbled to the surface. You think that I did it? I felt anger wearing with fear as I tried to think of a response. Just then he spoke again. I was going to bury her. I didn't want to wake anybody up and I didn't want anybody seeing her like this. He swallowed, taking a deep breath before continuing. But then, I found that stuffed into her mouth. He pointed as he spoke and I felt lightheaded when I turned to see the rock a few feet away on a clean portion of the patio. Without asking for an explanation, I stumbled over to it, lifting up the rock and picking up the note in the tangle of string that lay below. I glanced at Everett before opening the note to read a single word written in the same spidery handwriting that belonged to the cave. Tribute. I read it at least ten times, as if eventually it would make more sense than it had the previous time. Finally, I sat it back down as I had found it, slowly backing away before turning to Everett. What does it mean? He shook his head. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. Maybe Sandy was a tribute, a payment for those answers we've gotten. Maybe killing Sandy was supposed to be some bizarre tribute to us. Who knows? I, I, I don't know. Fuck. This doesn't make any sense. I looked around, my skin crawling at the idea that whatever did this could be watching us, leaping out of the dark when we weren't expecting it. Have you told Sarah? Everett shook his head again. I came straight to you. I don't know if we should tell her either. It'll just scare her for no reason. Letting out a long breath, I scrubbed my face with my hands and tried to clear my head. I'm not sure. I don't know what's best right now, but we can't leave this out like this. We have to bury her before anyone finds her or there'll be a lot more questions. With that set to work, we gingerly placed the dog into an oversized lawn bag and put her in the back of Everett's car. After grabbing a shovel from his garage, we headed south past the city limits before stopping at an edge of an apple orchid barrier. It took nearly two hours to dig the hole deep enough, the two of us taking turns at the shovel. As I dug, I reflected on the fact that we never even considered telling our families or the police about what had happened. It wasn't even an option anymore. We might tell ourselves that it was because we didn't want to get in trouble or have people thinking that we were crazy or on drugs, but that wasn't the truth. The truth was that, good or bad, the cave and its mystery were ours. Our secret and our treasure. Even with this, we weren't willing to give that up. So we buried Sandy in the dark, crying a little as we did it, both for her and ourselves. When we were finished, Everett thanked me, and we hugged. He dropped me off back at my house. I crept back upstairs, dirty, exhausted, and wondering if I'd even be able to sleep. As I opened the door to my bedroom, the details of the room were fuzzy in the bluish glow of the early morning that pressed against my window. Yet, it only took a second for me to see the rock sitting on my pillow, the paper tied to it, burning like a brand in the gloom. My breath caught in my chest. I crept softly to the bed and picked up the rock, pulling loose the string's bow with one tug. Paper fluttered to my bedspread, but I caught it as it landed. Opening it, I read the word written in that same familiar handwriting. Tribute. As 
What does this mean? Sarah's voice trembled as she spoke, her hands clasped in front of her knees to keep her from fidgeting. She'd found the same message we had when she woke up this morning. That had scared her enough on its own, but once we told her about finding Sandy that night, before, in my own note when I returned home, we were all struggling not to give in to total panic. I tried to think of something smart to say, or if not smart, at least reassuring. I had noted with more than a little satisfaction that she had directed the question toward me instead of Everett, and I had the sudden insane conviction that I could somehow prove myself the better man if only I could find the right answer. It means that it wants payment for its services. That's what it means. Everett had barely spoken since we finished catching Sarah up, and when he spoke now, his voice didn't waver. I looked at him and saw anger mixing with the fear in his eyes. It means whatever the fuck this is in that damn cave thinks we owe it something for doodling out a few answers to some stupid kid's questions. I nodded uncertainly. Maybe. Or maybe it's just trying to scare us for some crazy reason. Hell, it could be some kid we go to school with that is playing some stupid prank on us. Everett's eyes locked on mine. Do you honestly think anybody we go to school with, shit, anybody we know, could do what was done to Sandy? Even if they could, why the fuck would they? She... She was a good dog. He looked away, his jaw muscles jumping as he wiped at his eyes. Sarah broke in again. He's right. Who could have gotten into both of our houses and killed Sandy? And why would they? No. It's whatever's in that cave. It has to be. Okay, then. Let's say it is whatever that's in that cave that's doing this. What does that mean, exactly? Last time I checked, none of us had a fucking clue what was in that damn cave. Don't yell at her, man. It's not her fault. Everett's tone was softer, but I felt anger rushing through me. Don't fucking tell me what to do. How about that? He held up his hands as though to ward me off. Hey, I didn't mean anything. We just have to all stay calm, right? He looked down at the ground. We just... We need to figure out what to do. We should never have used the cave, Sarah said before adding, at least not without knowing what was inside. I almost laughed. Oh, really? Well, that's a brilliant fucking insight now, isn't it? Where were you three days ago when we started doing it? Oh, that's right. Right fucking beside us, leaving your own notes for the cave. Dude, cool it. Seriously, there's no point in blaming each other... I pointed my finger at Everett like a dagger, stabbing the air as my voice grew louder. So help me if you don't shut the fuck up defending your little fucking girlfriend, I will- Just then I heard Sarah crying. I looked to see her cradling her face in her hands, her body shaking with every sob. I couldn't take any more. Standing up, I started to walk away. I heard Everett stand up behind me, and I hoped that he would try to stop me so I could hit him. But then I heard him softly comforting Sarah, and I walked on, quickening my pace until I couldn't hear either of them any longer. I spent most of the day in my room, trying to sleep and failing. I finally went outside to lay in the hammock, and it was there that they found me. I expected Everett to start with some lame apology, but it was Sarah that spoke, her face still puffy from crying. Dylan, we have to talk. Her voice was steady and serious now, her face composed. Don't see as how we have anything to talk about at the moment. Apparently, even though I've done nothing wrong, I'm getting painted as the asshole in this little drama, so you'll just have to count me out. Sarah poked me hard in the side. Damn it, you know it's not like that. And if you don't, then you're an idiot. But I'm not talking about what's going on between the three of us. We can deal with that later. Later? 
Why not now? Why? Sarah broke in. Because if we don't deal with the cave, we might all be dead before we have a chance to talk about anything. That getting through to you? I stopped, feeling the breath seep out of me. She was right. It was something that we'd all known. But none of us had been willing to really face up to at that point. We didn't know what we were facing or how it would all turn out, and I was dragging us into a bunch of melodramatic bullshit that wouldn't count for anything if we were all dead. I thought about apologizing, but instead, I asked another question. What should we do then? Sarah swallowed before answering, and I could tell by Everett's expression that he knew what she was going to say. We have to go to the cave and confront whatever lives there. I sat up in the hammock, nearly pitching myself to the ground in the process. Confront it? What if it does to us what it did to that dog? Sarah sighed. I don't know. But do you have a better idea? Maybe we can reason with whatever it is, or maybe we can even kill it if it can't or won't listen to reason. Whatever the case, I don't plan on sitting around looking over my shoulder until this thing decides to do to me what it did to Sandy. I nodded, my head feeling heavy bobbing on a spring. Yeah, I guess. So we go confronted. I stood up, looking at both of them. Yeah, we do what we can. We went in my car, making it to the edge of the trail in less than 15 minutes. Everett had offered to drive, but I had insisted and Sarah agreed. The conversation heading into the woods was bizarre in its normalcy. We told jokes, talked about a movie we all wanted to see the next weekend, and generally just chattered. Our voices were steady most of the time, even light, but anyone that knew us as well as we knew each other could have heard the taut cord of tension buried in all of our words. Talking kept back the silence and helped us not to focus on where we were heading, but it also made it seem that we arrived far too soon clearing was unchanged from when we'd last left it, undisturbed by other messages or rocks or signs that anyone else had been there. I wasn't surprised. As far as I knew, no one else had come there for years. We all looked around the clearing as if expecting some monster to leap out from behind the bush and rush us. Standing in a tight, sweaty line with me in the middle, we gripped hands and walked toward the drop-off that led to the cave below. As we grew nearer, I found myself wanting to look anywhere but the black pit that was Mystery Cave, my eyes roaming the trees and bushes before moving to the ground beneath us, grass slowly fading into granite as we neared the edge. It was then that I noticed something strange that meant nothing to me at the time. A series of small lines in the rock and dirt cut hard and straight into the earth. They weren't deep but their precision made them stand out, and as we walked, I realized something else. The lines continued in alternating sets of diagonal lines, first one way and then to another, so that they were long enough to connect. A set of four might make a large X in the dirt. I was about to mention them when Sarah started screaming. Later, Sarah would swear that she had been looking right at the spot where the thing appeared. She said that it wasn't that it had blended in or magically faded into view, but that it was more like it was suddenly just there. All I know is that everything happened fast, even as I was running to look at Sarah. I felt Everett's hands being ripped out of mine, and when I saw that Sarah was looking in his direction, I looked back to see his head spinning back up to from where it had been to the side of the basin, his eyes rolling back in his head as he slid out of the grasp of the thing that had yanked his feet out from under him. The next moment, the next heartbeat in this nightmare we'd stumbled into, 
I looked at the monster that had my best friend. My descriptions won't be accurate. Even now, I can't say what I saw then for sure, as ridiculous as that sounds to me. There are elements of it. There aren't words, or if there are, I don't know them, but this is as close as I can come. Its head was skeletal, a human skull that was not human, its cheeks too protruding and its nostrils too long. The teeth were the most shocking feature at first. Long and translucent, they jutted out an impossible angle to intersect like the clasped jaws of an anglerfish. Again, I'm doing a poor job of describing it. It wasn't a skeleton, that's just what it reminded me of. It had skin, tissue, semi-clear and swimming with ever-shifting blobs of black and blue color. Its skin was the thin membrane of a jellyfish stretched taut across an unnatural skull before sliding down to molted shoulders and arms that ended in powerful-looking hands, whose nailless fingertips were peppered with what looked to be tiny protruding bits of black rock or bone. Its torso was like that of a man, yet instead of trailing down to waist and legs, it ended in tattered bits of pale, ragged meat. I saw a war movie years later that showed a soldier crawling toward a radio, oblivious to the fact that his lower half had been blown away. I was immediately reminded of this monster, yet this creature's tattered flesh was not wet or wounded, but was instead coated in a thick rime of rock dust and old dried mud. All of this was the impression of an instant. A desperate glimpse as my hands sought and found Everett's arms. Sarah was making a terrible squealing sound beside me, but she'd grabbed his left arm as well, so I let go of it to focus on his right. As we began working to pull him free, it felt as though he'd been half buried in a concrete wall, our efforts starting and ending with the flexibility of Everett's own limbs as his lower half remained motionless in the thing's grip. Sarah was crying softly now, desperately tugging at Everett's arm as his eyes fluttered open. It only took a moment for him to look down. What? Oh. Oh god, oh no, help, help, help! I saw the dark stain spreading along the crotch of his shorts, and I was about to renew my efforts to pull him safely when my eyes met those pale, ghastly things below. I had been wrong in thinking its eyes were empty sockets. Deep within their recesses, a small, cold blue light burned like two twin distant stars, malevolence and dispassion living in those fires terrifying me. Yet even then, staring into the face of the monster, I kept my grip on Everett. It turned to look at Sarah and then back to me, back and forth as it began to speak. Once, when we were around eight, Sarah and I had been playing near a large ditch drain pipe when I heard a sound. When we'd gone to the edge of the cylinder of the corrugated steel, curious as to what could be making the sound, getting swept up in the mystery of it, peering into the darkness, we were captivated for several moments before I realized what it was. A hurt animal. Far down in the dark pipe and wailing out in pain, it screams alien and hollow from where we stood. This was the voice we heard when the monster spoke. Inhuman, unintelligible. It was only one word spoken again and again, and yet somehow we understood it perfectly. Mystery repeated it again, giving Everett another powerful tug. Tribute. Sarah's eyes widened, and she cried out as realization struck her, almost losing her grip on Everett's left arm. For his part, Everett had come to understand what was being said, but he didn't scream or cry out. Instead, his cries cut off and he remained silent for the next several seconds, aside from the regular raspy huff of his panicked breaths. Those seconds stretched on forever, our desperate tugging doing little to dislodge Mystery's grip on him. 
My arms and shoulders were already burning with the effort, but I pushed myself not to give up or let go, and then Everett spoke. Let me go. Sarah sucked in a rasping breath. What? No! We're going to get you... We're going to get you free. I felt myself shaking my head. No way. I wanted to yell at mystery, but I was too afraid, imagining the monster dropping Everett only to leap up upon me. I turned back to Everett. We're going to get you out of this. Everett squinted his eyes as he looked at us, his teeth gritted. No. You have to let... Oh, God, it hurts. You have to let me do this. Let me be the tribute. It'll leave you alone, then. Mystery had silenced its terrible voice as soon as Everett had first told us to let him go. Its grip firm as it slowly and teasingly slid him further down a little at the time, pulling us closer to the edge every single time. Sarah was silent as well, not even seeming to react when Everett let go of our arms, his dirty face lined with tear tracks as he was screamed for us to let him go. Oh, man. It's the only way, Dylan. Just do it. I looked at Sarah, expecting her to be crying or hysterical. To my surprise, she was looking back at me. A look passed between us, and then we let Everett go. We immediately turned and began running for the edge of the clearing and the trail beyond. The scrabble of rock and Everett's screams, growing distant as he was drug down into the cave. I looked back once for a second, just in time to see the last of Everett, his hand, disappear into the darkness. After that, we kept running. Two hours later, we were in my room, alternatively crying and yelling, comforting and accusing each other. We talked about Everett's sacrifice to save us and how we had no choice other than to leave him behind. We talked about how we should have never gone to the cave in the first place, or at least, I added, been more careful, and how we only had ourselves to blame. We talked about whether or not it was over now, or if it would keep coming until it had taken us all. We didn't talk about rescuing Everett or telling anyone so they could help us. We both knew Everett was gone now. Sarah didn't want to go home, so we asked if she could spend the night in the guest room. After the house was dark, my door opened and she crept into the room. I said, it's okay if I stay with you? My heart thudded as I whispered yes in the dark. And moments later, her body was inches from mine, her breath stirring in my nostrils as I tried to rein in the thoughts that jumped and burned through my mind like wind-lofted embers before being replaced by the next red-orange cloud. Should I say something? Do something? Go to sleep? Hold her? Kiss her? I sat for half an hour or more frozen in a state of inaction and fear. My choice was made for me when I heard her softly snoring next to me. Smiling to myself, I buried my face in my pillow, eventually drifting off to sleep. I'm convinced that the only reason that human beings have been so successful as a species is that we can adapt to anything given enough time and motivation. Yet, whatever benefits that may bring... It also creates our worst monsters. It allows child abuse to become a routine and concentration camps a job. It allows violence and hatred to become a background noise that only gets dialed up when it directly affects us. It was that same adaptability that allowed me to wonder what to do while laying next to Sarah, despite the fact that just hours before, I'd seen my best friend get dragged away by a horror that shouldn't even exist. The adaptability and perhaps some 
hidden truth nestled in the dark corner of my brain or some insight into what was to come. When I woke the next morning, my first thought was of Sarah beside me, not of Everett. The second was that something hard was resting against my leg. Finally, the third was Everett. Guilt, pain, panic fluttering in my chest as I rubbed my eyes open. I looked over at Sarah still sleeping, her black hair fanned across her face, so beautiful that it made me ache. I turned to look at her better and felt the hard object resting against my leg roll slightly. Looking down, I saw it was another message rock and nearly screamed. After staring at it for a full minute like it was a snake waiting to strike, I gently sat up enough to grab it before lying back down as quietly as possible. Whatever it was, I wanted to read it and think about it before waking Sarah. Pulling the string, I eased to open the dirty paper, thick and discolored like old parchment. It said, Tribute accepted. Now name your need. I kept rereading it. My heart deafening in my chest. It seemed to be saying that it was satisfied with the tribute, and that in exchange it wanted us to name what we wanted. I didn't know. And if so, why? Out of curiosity? So it could grant our wish like some kind of homicidal genie? So it could demand another tribute? Or was it simply playing with us for its own purpose? I don't know. Finally, I woke Sarah. She took it better than I had. Her face had gone pale as I told her, but within a couple of minutes she was concentrating on the note, her eyebrows bunched as she went over it again and again. I sat watching but unfocused as I jumped a little when she spoke. Make sure there's not a second rock anywhere. Nodding, I got up and checked the bed sheets and the floor, searching the entire room until I was satisfied there was nothing to be found. When I was finished, I went back to the bed and asked her what she thought. Well, it looks like it was saying that Everett... Everett was the tribute that it wanted. Tears welled up in her eyes and she wiped them away angrily, taking a deep breath before going on. And that now it wants to know what we need. Maybe as a gift for the tribute, or maybe to start another round of us owing it something. I don't know. I nodded. Yeah, that's what I think too. I don't know which it is either, or if it's something else we haven't thought of. Wrapping her arms around her legs, Sarah stared off at nothing as she spoke. Two other things. I think that it's been for us to name what we need together. Otherwise, why not two rocks? Unless there's one waiting for me at my house, I think it wants one request, not two. Which, I guess makes sense if this is some kind of repayment for, uh, for our tribute. She started crying then, gentle sobs muted by her face being pressed up against her legs. I rubbed her back, trying to awkwardly comfort her while fighting back tears myself. Then, to take her mind away from crying, I asked, What was the second thing? She looked up, her eyes red and puffy. What? Oh. Yeah. The second thing is, I don't think it was asking us to tell what we need. You don't? She shook her head slightly. No. I think it was telling us. Telling us to tell it what we want. I was going to say more when there was a knock on the door, followed a moment later by my mother sticking her head in, looking uncomfortable as she saw us sitting together on my bed. Then she noticed Sarah had been crying and her expression turned to one of concern. Sweetie, are you alright? God, 
Did you already hear? Sarah looked up confusedly. What? Did, did I hear what? My mother's face fell a little. Your grandmother just called here looking for you. It's... It's your mother, sweetie. Her grandma had to take her to the hospital last night. She's real sick. Sarah's mother had been growing worse for months. It had reached the point where the woman could barely stand or walk at all, and Sarah's grandmother had been staying with them the last few weeks to help out. Still, Roberta's sudden downturn during the night came as a surprise to both of us, and as I drove her to the hospital, Sarah just kept saying that it was her fault. You couldn't have known, and you couldn't have done anything that hasn't already been done. But I could have been there. I haven't been there enough. Instead of goofing off or spending time with you and with you guys, I, I should have been taking care of her. I shook my head, not taking my eyes off the road. No. That's shit. You did help take care of her. But you had your life too. You couldn't just lock yourself up in that house with her all the time. That's no kind of life for anybody. I saw her nod at the corner of my eye. More to in the argument than out of agreement. Yeah, I guess. Just hurry. We were told that Roberta's kidneys, damaged in the car accident years before, had failed, and that her liver and pancreas were both on the edge of shutting down. She was on dialysis, and while the doctors we spoke with promised to do what they could, they indicated that it was more of a matter of time than anything else. I stayed at the hospital until midnight, and when I got home, I saw that my mother had left me a note saying that Everett's parents had called twice, asking if we knew where their son was. I called them back the next day and began repeating the lie that Sarah and I had worked out the night she'd stayed over. We last saw Everett the morning of his disappearance, and yes, we sure were worried too. It was three days later when Sarah called me. Her voice was hoarse, trembling. She started in without saying hello. But she's getting worse. I've been thinking and I know what I have to do. What we have to do. If you go with me. If not, I'm still going. I asked her what, but I already knew. I had already decided that I would go with her. The next day we returned to the cave, our message rock already prepared so we wouldn't have to spend any more time there than necessary. I made Sarah stand at the edge of the clearing as I threw the rock into the cave, my eyes everywhere as I watched for a sudden attack. Everything was silent, only a lonely bird's cry far above momentarily breaking the quiet. Within three hours, Sarah's mother began a miraculous recovery. Within twelve, her kidneys were fine, her pain was gone, and she could walk as if the car accident had never happened. They kept her in the hospital for another two days out of confusion and consternation more than any need for treatment. And when she was released, she drove us all home, laughing and making jokes as if the last few years had been a bad dream. I smiled at Sarah, reaching out to give her hand a squeeze. At that moment, we felt no fear or regret, despite everything that had happened. As everything does... We were moving on. In the months that followed, Sarah and I spent time together, but I noticed a growing divide. As terrible as it was to think of it in such terms, there was no longer anything to keep us from being together. And yet, instead of growing closer, we were moving further apart. That summer, Sarah and her mother went up north to visit relatives they hadn't seen in years, and when they came back, I, I knew something was different. She came to see me a few days after she was back, dropping by casually, even though it had been killing me not to rush her over the second I heard she was back. 
It was a short and awkward visit, and less than five minutes into the conversation, she tossed out that she had met someone on her trip. Rotten meat thrown between us, greasing to a stop and making me want to vomit. I nodded and tried to act interested, but we both knew this was placating. She acted as though nothing was wrong, which she probably justified as sparing my feelings, but which was really intended to spare herself any discomfort. But then she hit me with her next news. Dylan, I think I need to take some time off from being around you. We were sitting in my front yard, and she studiously watched the street as she spoke. I felt my stomach fall further than it already had. What? Why? And then, after a pause, didn't we just take a two and a half month break from seeing each other? She nodded, throwing me a sad smile before looking at the road again. Yeah, I know. And that's kind of what made me realize I need some time apart. We've been through so much, we've always been so close, and we always will be, but I've been eaten up with guilt and worry the last few months, and while it wasn't gone when I was away, it was a lot better, and I've realized that a lot of that is because I wasn't around you. Me? What the fuck did I do to- She held up her hand to stop me, turning to meet my eyes for a moment. Let me finish. When I look at you, I see Everett. I see everything we've done. And no, maybe it wasn't our fault, but still, it doesn't feel right either. I need some time to sort through that. I wanted to scream at her and storm away, but I fought the urge to keep my voice level. What about your mom? Are you sorry that we did that? She started tearing up and looked away. No, uh, of course not, but... And what about me? Do you think there's not anything that I wanted? But I didn't say anything, but sure thing, when you wanted to use your wish or whatever on curing your mom, I was happy to do it. Sarah sighed and nodded, wiping her cheeks. Dylan, I know that. And I love you for it, but that doesn't change how I feel. She turned back to me. It's not forever, you know. I just need some time to clear my head. I stood up. Fine. Take your time. Let me know when you want to be my friend again. I walked away purposely, ignoring her calls for me to come back and slamming the door behind me when I reached the house. I thought she'd call me that night, hopefully having realized her mistake and begging for my forgiveness. She didn't call that night. Or the next... Or the one after that. Aside from chance encounters, during which I made a point of ignoring her attempts at greeting me, we didn't see each other for the rest of the school year. I found out through mutual friends she had decided she was going to college in Michigan to be with her boyfriend, Chad. I'd seen him once or twice when he had come down to visit during the past year. He looked like a stupid blonde ape, always smiling and looking goofy as they rode around with their friends. Time of their lives, I'm sure. I was staying local myself. My grades were good enough to go pretty much wherever I wanted, but I didn't care where I went, so I didn't see the point in wasting the money going somewhere far off. To thank me for my frugality, my parents gave me a month-long trip in Europe. My first instinct was to politely refuse, but then I realized the only reason I didn't want to go was Sarah. Some pathetic part of me was still holding out hope of changing things over the summer. Once I knew that was the reason, I forced myself to accept. The trip was wonderful, and it gave me some perspective. I didn't understand why Mystery had lied to me about Sarah loving me, or at least tricked me as to what it meant by love, but I'd have to accept it and move on. By the time I got back in August, Sarah was already gone to Michigan, and classes started for me two weeks later. 
Months passed, and I never considered returning to that cave or feared finding message rocks waiting for me on my bed. As strange as it may seem, I really thought about Mystery or Everett in those days, and by the time that Christmas vacation rolled around, I was feeling normal, more like me than I had in years. Then Sarah called. She was crying, telling me that she was in an airport waiting for her flight home, but she needed to talk to somebody, needed to talk to me. I said, okay, my head's swimming. I asked what was wrong. They say I've got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Cancer. It's... It's already in the late stages. She laughed bitterly, her voice brittle and slightly metallic over the phone. <laughs> they say they don't understand why it didn't show more symptoms earlier on. Guess I'm pretty hardy, huh? I couldn't breathe. I sat down on the edge of my bed, shutting my eyes tight as I tried to focus on getting something out. They can treat it, right? They'll treat it, yeah? Her despair was palpable as she answered. They're going to try. But they've already let me know it's pretty much a done deal. It'll take a few months probably, but... I'm gonna die. I gripped the phone tight enough to make the plastic creak in protest. No. No, you're not. Just get here and we'll figure something out. I... I swear to you, we will. Stellar Thompson was a junkie and a drunk, at least when he was prosperous. Given that he was one of the town's few long-standing homeless... That wasn't often. No one hassled him much. The old man was amiably pathetic, tragic without seeming dangerous or making you too uncomfortable. Most days you'd find him watching squirrels as they jumped and played in the park, though whether his steady gaze signified deep thought or mindless stupor was open for debate. If you passed him on the street, he'd smile and nod, and every other time he would ask for a bit of spare change. He asked in an easy casual way that made it easier to refuse, but also made him asking less of an intrusion, less of a bother. And that was what he wanted. To blend in and go unseen. Living in the background meant no one noticed you or bothered you. When we walked up to Stellar, he looked genuinely surprised. He was at the back of the hardware store, pitching a pair of pennies at the wall in some strange game of his own device, chuckling occasionally to himself. He smiled when he saw us, but he was wary underneath, wondering why we were there and why we were coming towards him. Sarah spoke first. Hey, Stellar. What you up to? He smiled again, ducking his head and stuffing those pennies in his hands and his pockets of his ratty brown overcoat. Ah, oh, nothing much. Just pitching, laying around. Nothing wrong with being here, is it? I can go. I'll just... I'll just go. He was already shuffling away as I panicked and realized he might really leave before we could convince him. Well, Stellar, we, we don't want you to go. We were just coming to ask you about something. See if you could, uh, do us a favor. When he turned back to us, he looked uncertain and curious. Then he broke into a brown grin. Well, sure, if I can help you kids. Sarah nodded, giving him her most charming smile. You can. She pushed her hair behind her ear and leaned in conspiratorially. You see, Dylan and I wanted to get some liquor, but we're still underage. We drink all the time at college, and it's hard getting it when we're home. You understand, don't you? Stellar was already nodding, his eyes bright. He'd had this conversation 
dozens if not hundreds of times before. Kids would use him to buy booze, giving him money or a drink in return. I had friends in high school that recommended Stellar the way you would recommend a dependable accountant or mechanic. He was discreet, didn't ask questions, and didn't attract undue attention. He was perfect. After he'd gone back into the car with the liquor, we drove north to the woods. Sarah had thought up our stipulation that we would buy him a bottle of his own, but he had to go and drink with us afterwards. Stellar was only too happy to agree, licking his lips excitedly as his head bobbed up and down like a dashboard doll. His smell had not been noticeable in the chilly afternoon air, but after a few minutes in the car with the heat on, the garbage stench that rolled off him in waves was almost overpowering. I could tell that Sarah was as grateful as I was when we were able to leave the car behind. The entire walk to the cave, Stellar never questioned where we were going. One look at his face would tell anyone that he was desperate to snatch the brown paper sack from my hand, but he was old and patient. He kept his craving at bay and waited. When we reached the clearing, he smiled, looking at me expectantly. Nodding, I took out a bottle of whiskey and handed it to him. He'd spun the top off expertly and taken a long pull before I took out beers for myself and Sarah. For the next 30 minutes, Sarah and I nursed our beers while Stellar drank steadily, his back to the cave, happy and oblivious. In my mind, I had pictured a long argument with Sarah over my plan. I had prepared speeches and justifications, reasonable explanations and unassailable points. In the end, when I told her that we could use the cave, that we would use mystery to save her, there was no surprise or outrage. Her first question was not how, why. It was who. The choice had been obvious, though it had still taken me several hours of contemplation to arrive at Stellar Thompson, someone who wouldn't be missed whose life was an utter waste, a man who had squandered any chances and talents he had ever had to live life as a homeless, drunken druggie who had slit his own mother's throat for a drink or a tweak. Compare that to Sarah. Sarah, who was still young and had her whole life ahead of her, a life full of promise. She decided she'd wanted to become a doctor and help people. This, she said, was how she would make up for what we were doing. This is how she would make Stellar sacrifice worthwhile. She cried as she said it, and I knew it had to be true. Stellar was a seasoned alcoholic, and I honestly expected it to take longer for him to get drunk, but after reaching the clearing, something made the old man nervous. Out of a nearly instinctive reaction to the sense of unease, he drank fast and hard, as though he feared we might take the bottle from it at any moment. The three of us spoke, but only occasionally, the sound of our forced laughter and idle chatter falling false on my ear. Once I decided that Stellar was drunk enough, but before he moved into the swiftly approaching area of too drunk, I stood up and nodded for Sarah to do the same. I looked down at the old man, a smile hanging large on my face. Hey man, you want to see something cool? Stellar looked up like a physicist, interrupted during a complex equation. Huh? No, I, I'm okay. Thanks, though, man. This is good shit. I nodded, keeping the smile in place. Sure. No problem. But seriously, I want you to tell me what you think of this. It, it's right over here. I paused and then added, There's another drink in it for you. He hesitated at that. Then he smiled widely. You know, that sure sounds cool, but I remembered, man. I've got a friend that I'm supposed to be meeting. Uh, I gotta go. <sighs> I shook my head. No worries. We'll drive you back. Just come over here and see this thing, then we'll go. Honest. 
He smiled again, nodding as he got shakily to his feet. Sounds cool and all, but I'll walk back. I could use the exercise. The fresh air, you know what I mean? Be seeing... He'd been so focused on me that he hadn't noticed Sarah behind him, a large rock held over her head. When she struck him in the back of the head, he tumbled forward without a sound, and I felt sure that he was dead, thinking fearfully that the thing in the cave wouldn't take someone who was already dead as a tribute. Why I thought the last, I couldn't say, but it seemed true as I thought it. Sarah must have thought the same thing, because she dropped the rock and rushed forward to check for a pulse. After a moment of groping around, trying to avoid the blood that was trickling freely from the back of Stellar's head, she looked at me and nodded. He's alive. It's weak, though. Without another word, we began pulling him towards the drop-off. When we reached the edge, we looked at one another for the space of a second and then shoved him over. He rolled a long distance, thumping and bumping himself to the edge of the cave's dark entrance. And then there was only silence. After several minutes of hearing nothing, I called out in a loud voice, working to keep tremors out of it. Tribute! We bring you tribute! Before the final word out of my mouth, Stellar Thompson had been drug away into the black. Afterward, we didn't discuss whether or not we had done the right thing. We didn't question the coincidence or bad luck behind both Roberta's and Sarah's brushes with death so close together. We just waited. Two weeks later, Sarah was given a clean bill of health. She broke up with her dear sweet Chad during winter finals, and while she didn't give me any details, I knew the reasons. One reason, at least I hoped, was me. But the real reason, I think, was that she saw herself differently than now than she had before. The following summer, Sarah and I were inseparable. The guilt that had pushed us apart before now bound us tightly together. We shared a secret that no one else knew, and that no one else could ever know, and that made us unique as snowflakes, bright and shining and alone together. It might seem that this would make our relationship morbid and destructive, but it was neither. As the days grew longer and then shorter again, we spent hours talking and taking rides, going to movies, being bored together. I loved her so much. Strangely, during all this, we did nothing that was overly romantic. I was more than willing, but I knew enough to wait until the time was right. The moment would come, and I was patient enough to wait for it. I'd been waiting for years, after all. Sarah kissed me for the first time on... August 19th of the summer before our sophomore year, less than three days before she left to go back to school. We were sitting in the dugout at the old ball field, the same place we had pondered the message that predicted Autumn Lester's death, the same place we had played and roamed for years before that. I was lost in that kiss, my body tingling and my mind racing as we finally pulled away from each other several minutes later. I looked down at the ground, afraid my voice would betray too much if I spoke before clearing my head. When I finally did look at Sarah, I saw tears glistening down her cheeks. What is it? What's wrong? She shook her head, two quick jerks in alternating directions as she wiped her eyes. Nothing. Nothing. Just... Thank you, Dylan. Thank you. You've always been there for me, always helped me. She turned away, staring out into space. And this last... She fell silent, shaking her head again as she held her face in her hands. I reached out and touched her arm lightly. What we did was what was necessary. It was the only way. She looked up at me, her eyes red and shining. Was it? I... 
I don't know. We took his life so I could have mine. No. No, we didn't. That thing in the cave did, and even if we helped, so what? It's better that some old bum that had wasted his life and would never do anything should live for a few more years, or hell, maybe months rather than you. You who are young and beautiful and have so much ahead of you. When she sat silent, I went on. No. It'd be a tragedy. That's what it'd be. A goddamned travesty. If I had to do it over, I wouldn't hesitate. We made the right choice. Nearly a minute passed before she nodded, turning to look at me one last time before standing up. Well, I just wanted you to know. Thank you. Unable to think of the right response, I just nodded and followed her off the field. We only saw each other once more before she headed off for school, and then we only met for a quick goodbye lunch before she left. I wanted to kiss her again, to tell her that she could come back to school now that things were over with Chad. Yet something kept me from it, telling me that it wasn't the right time. So instead, I carried the last of her stuff to her car and gave her a hug, making her promise to give me a call when she got a chance. She nodded and smiled, waving to Roberta and me as she drove away. When she passed out of sight, Roberta turned to me, a solemn look on her face. You love that girl, don't you, Dylan? I was stunned, blurting out the truth before I could fabricate a lie. Yes, ma'am. I do. Uh, I mean, Berta smiled and gave me a small laugh then. <laughs> no need to backpedal with me. I've known that for a long time. And that's more than fine with me. Just, she trailed off, several seconds passing before she began again. My girl's going through a lot of changes lately. Last year, well, she's just different. Have you noticed it? I shrugged and nodded. I guess so. She's got a lot going on, I guess. Well, I'm sure you're right. She studied my face, having to look up at me slightly since my last growth spurt. She put her hand on my shoulder. Just be careful. Both for her sake and yours. I don't know what I'd do if anything ever happened to either of you. I smiled and gave her a hug, hanging around for a few more minutes before making up an excuse for why I needed to go back home. Weeks went by without a call from Sarah, and I fought to maintain my resolve not to call her first. I knew from Roberta that she was safely back at school, but beyond that, Sarah's mother would volunteer little a strange expression often passing across her face as she assured me that Sarah was likely very busy with school at the moment. It was the middle of October when Sarah's letter came. There was only two sentences, written in Sarah's flowing cursive. My heart pounded as I opened the letter, full of hope and dread for what it might say. And then I read it. The world faded away and my breath stopped. It said, Chad and I are engaged. I'm so sorry, Dylan. I threw it away from me with fear and disgust, folding in on myself until I was sitting on the floor, too numb to yell or cry. What was I supposed to do? Roberta watched the credits for The Thin Man, thinking, not for the first time, how much shorter movie credits used to be. She wondered if that meant movies were more complex now, or that people just used to not get as much credit. Either way, it was hard to beat William Powell and Myrna Loy together, and her willingness to stay up so late was a testament to that. Since her miracle recovery, Roberta had gotten her real estate license and had been doing pretty well in the last few months. Sighing, she stood up in the dark living room, wishing again that she hadn't scheduled a showing for eight this morning. Still, she thought, 
It could mean a big sale, so I shouldn't bitch so much. She phoned around on the sofa until she found her cell phone, hitting the button to briefly turn on the phone's luminescent screen. She nearly always used the phone instead of her home telephone, and it was rare that it wasn't close by. The light flickered out after two seconds, so she hit it again and began moving out of the room. Old movie or not, Roberta had always been a night owl. Sarah, on the other hand, had always been annoyingly chirpy in the morning and went to bed early at night. Back during the bad times, Roberta had slept little. She would lie awake for hours, staring into darkness as she gritted her teeth in pain. Later, when she was better, she would still sit up late, enjoying time to herself without the pain and the fear that had been her world for so many years. Sierra would usually be several hours asleep before Roberta went to bed. Her daughter's bedroom door always opened wide and on the way down to the hallway to Roberta's own room. Not wanting to turn on a hallway light and risk disturbing Sarah and refusing to lug around a flashlight like some kind of lunatic, Roberta had taken to using her cell phone light to light her way. Even now, with Sarah back at school for nearly two months, she still went to bed with the house dark and a soft blue glow to guide her. She moved into the front foyer as the light went out again. Light. Moved to the bottom of the stairs. Light. Halfway up. Light. On the way to the top. It was during this last stretch up the stairs that she thought she heard something. A tap, 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 so faint it seemed dreamlike in her sleepy state. She paused, listening for another noise. It had sounded as if it had come from one of the rooms upstairs, but she couldn't say for sure. Noises sounded strange in the dark, and though it didn't sound like a noise she recalled commonly hearing, it was probably just the house creaking or settling or passing gas. She grinned to herself at that last thought, imagining the house turning on the air conditioner to try and mask its embarrassing flatulence. Satisfied with no repeat of the sounds, she started up the stairs again. Light. Top of the stairs. Light. Past Sarah's room in the bathroom. Light. Staring into the face of a monster, the icy pinpricks of light that stirred for its eyes outshined the phone's illumination. Its hands, cold and terrible, shot out to dig out the meat of her and pull her inside her bedroom, a tiny, gasping squeal escaping from between its impossibly long and sharp teeth. The door slammed shut behind her, and she had a final moment to stare at the glistening death's head, drawing closer before the phone's light went out one last time, leaving her in the dark to scream. you so much. I grinned at Sarah, drumming my fingers on the steering wheel as we waited for the light to change. I love you too. We're gonna have such an awesome time, you know what? She smiled back and nodded. Yeah. You were right. This trip was just the graduation gift we both needed. I'm glad we gave it to each other. Laughing, she started fiddling with the radio stations, trying to find something that wasn't dire news or country twang. After several minutes, she settled onto an oldie station, singing along softly to herself. I looked over at her, seeing that underlying disquiet that was always with her now. It saddened me to see her troubled, and I hoped this trip would help with that. The past two years have been hard on both of us, but it had worked out for the best in the end. We were together now, and in love, and whatever we had given up to get there, I knew that it would be worth it. Rubbing my forehead, I tried to push the background noise from my mind and enjoy the drive. That was the key, right? To not be a prisoner of the past, but to instead focus on the future. That night, after we had made love and fallen asleep, I began to dream. Or rather, I began to remember. 
was back in the clearing, calling out the mystery, telling it that I needed help. I was ready to set my rock down when it was suddenly right below me, looking up and regarding me silently. I was frozen in terror. Images of being drug away into the cave flooding my mind as it looked at the rock in my hand and then back to me letting out a short wailing sound. Not the rock. Beyond that now. I understood. Hearing words that were not words. Seeing images in my mind that were disorienting and yet signified. In the dreams as I had in real life. Two years before, I knelt down, leaning my head forward as mystery opened its razor maw to expose a long whip of a tongue, black and malignant. On the center of its tongue, just an inch above its narrow tip, a small yellow spur of bone jutted out from the flesh around it, a tiny iceberg floating in a sea of darkness. The tissue around it was red and swollen, giving me a moment of pause. And then I thought of Sarah and braced myself. I expected terrible pain or worse, but there was none of that. Instead, all I received was the gentlest of touches as Mystery's tongue pressed to my forehead for a moment before drawing back. The spur of bone was gone, leaving behind a raw, wet socket of flesh that was already filling in. Reaching up to my forehead, my fingertips brushed the last edge of the bone as it disappeared into my head, leaving no mark behind. A few seconds later, I began to notice a background buzz in my head, feedback from the link that now existed between the monster and myself. It didn't matter much to me then, but it wasn't long before I grew to hate it. When Mystery spoke this time, I understood her clearly. I say she, because now when she spoke, I could sense her uniquely feminine presence and powers that filled my mind. It both comforted and terrified me, but I kept my gaze steady on hers as she asked her question without making a sound. What do you offer as tribute for your need? In life, I was prepared for that question holding the image of murder in my mind until I could feel that mystery was satisfied. Why I thought that mere selection would be enough of a tribute, and why I picked Roberta, I can't say for sure. I was half crazy with losing Sarah, for one thing. But for another, I think I'd already come to realize that the bigger thing you asked for, for mystery, the bigger thing you had to give up in return. And Roberta, well... It would probably have pained me less to give up my own mother. Two years before, though, my guilt and sadness over losing Roberta had been consumed by my anguish over having already lost Sarah, and I was filled with relief when Mystery responded. Very well. Your tribute is accepted. I woke up weeping and afraid, Sarah still sleeping peacefully beside me. The next morning, I asked her to marry me. Some people say that life is a straight line. That you're born, you travel through a series of events, meeting people, and learning things as you go, and at the end you die, either ending the line or heading off in a new direction, depending on your theology. Another common theory is that life is a circle. A cycle that loops without end. History repeats itself and all of that. Or how some people say that you start life and end life with others having to take care of you. Or that you are born and die alone. I remember reading a poem once that talked about coming back to the same place that you started from and finding it anew. I always took that to mean that it's not the place that's different, but that you've changed yourself, and because of that change, you see everything from a new perspective. It's a nice idea, but I don't think it's right. I think that life is a spiral. You move along, heading up or heading down, and you're always someplace new, even if you never leave the town you were raised in. 
always moving forward, unable to touch or change the past except in your memories. Yet at the same time, your life is curving, always curving, coming back to near where you once were, almost close enough to touch. You'll see places and faces you knew, you'll glimpse what you once were. Sarah and I were happy for nearly 20 years. For most of that time, I ran a website design company out of our house while she built on the real estate business that her mother had started before she passed away. We were successful, and for the most part, we were happy. We had our troubles, just like anyone does, but our love for one another always pulled us back together in the end. I wondered if in those first years, if she knew about the tributes I would make periodically to mystery. I was always so careful, and I would only get the call for another every few months, no more than two or three times a year. Later, I could see it in her face when she looked at me. I would glance at her when she didn't know I was looking, and it was in her eyes. At first, I was scared, and then I was angry. In time, when she never mentioned it, never accusing or questioning, I realized she had accepted it as part of what was necessary to maintain our life, our success, our love. And that made me cherish her even more. Of course, I wasn't naming things we needed any longer. Other than paying tribute when it was asked, I had no ties to mystery in those days. Well, that and the noise in my head. I would always feel her rustling in the back of my brain, that just audible hum and crackle that I could never entirely adjust to or block out. Once, only once, I think I shared a dream she had. It was black and terrible, full of faces I knew and things that made no sense. Impossible things. Impossible. Still... What reason did I have to ask for such things? We had everything we needed and we were happy. And then the trip came. Sarah had met Gladys Merrill back when the two of them were working toward their real estate licenses, and ten years later when Gladys moved out of state, Sarah promised she'd come to visit. It was one of those absent promises that you always intend to keep but never do. And then she did. She'd been gone for two weeks, far longer than we had ever been apart since Roberta had died when she called me crying. She said that it wasn't working anymore, that it hadn't worked for a long time, and that she guessed she had needed to get away to see that. She said she loved me, but that she couldn't stay with me. She said that that fucking cunt Gladys was giving her work, and that she was going to stay out there for a while. Six months passed, and then a year. One day, I found myself putting the house up for sale so that I could move into a sprawling old Victorian on the edge of the northern woods. The feeling in my head was stronger so close to the cave, but I didn't mind. I had no friends anymore, no colleagues. My father was gone eight years, my mother four. I had devoted all of my time to building a life for Sarah and myself. Now I found myself with nothing. I kept making the tributes. Most of the time, I would use drunks, children. They were the easiest to control as long as you went far enough out and never to the same place twice. No one would put it together. Besides, she was always looking out for me. By the time I snatched April Moreland, I'd grown bold. I pulled next to her in a mall parking lot as she walked to her car in the middle of the afternoon, yanking her in before she could scream. I knew that mystery would keep anyone from noticing what was happening, even if she had screamed a little. It was such an easy thing. April was 16, 17 maybe, and had the face of a girl that was only pretty due to the glow of her youth. In another 10 years, it would be a different story. The girl's fleeting beauty and best years both behind her. In my 20s, I would have carried a gun to hold her and keep her from trying to escape. Now I knew that the fear would be enough. She cried softly the entire way back to the cave, but she only asked to be let go once, her voice dying when I gave her a hard glance. 
When I got her out to walk up to the trail, she made a half-hearted attempt to run, but a quick swat against the side of the panel van I used for these trips ended her resistance. The walk to the cave was silent, and when we reached the clearing, I moved her quickly to the stone lip. I was about to shove her in when she turned to me, her eyes red and shining. Please, please don't do this. You don't have to. I'll never tell and just... Please. That last word stretched out into a wail that would have been comical in another situation. I paused for a moment, the raw emotion in her voice disrupting the routine that had established over the years. She grabbed the front of my shirt as her knees threatened to buckle under her. You're a good man. I can tell. Please don't do this. Let me go. Swallowing, I gently pried her hands away. I can't. I don't have a choice. She shook her head, sobs overtaking her again and muddying her words. Why? Why are you doing this? This is what I am. Smiling sadly, I gave her a solid shove in the chest, sending her tumbling into the darkness. Taking a deep breath, I whispered, I bring you tribute, before turning away and heading back to the van. I've always been in control of what happened, I realize that. The thing she put in my head is just a link to me. It doesn't allow her to influence me or take me over. I know, because a year and a half after Sarah left, I sat on the edge of my bed with the barrel of a shotgun I had only used once before, pressed against the soft flesh of the line of my jaw. I thought about using my toe to work the trigger, but dying barefoot always seemed undignified to me for some reason. I ended up using a small plastic pole cue that had come with a gag mini pool table that I'd gotten for Christmas years before. It was just long enough to slip against the trigger. Of course, I didn't go through with it. I don't guess I was ever going to. But I learned something from it. Mystery couldn't have stopped me if I'd wanted to do it. I think she even knew it was happening. I found that strangely comforting later on. But that day, after storing the gun away and returning the little pool stick to its tiny patch of green felt, I was far from being comforted by anything. There was nothing special about that day, just months of loneliness and grief and guilt hounding me as I spiraled and spiraled on, all of it coming to a head on a random day in the middle of spring. That's what had made me reckless enough to pull out the gun. That's what made me fearless enough to seek out an answer to what I had been doing for nearly 30 years. It was dark by that time, and I reached the clearing in the cave. I didn't hesitate, because hesitation would have required thought, and I had burned through my last of desire to think weeks before. I didn't want to live. I didn't want to die. Mostly, I didn't want to think or feel. In the end, I settled for understanding. The cave was large and cool, the temperature dropping as I moved further into its depths. A dozen steps left behind the little moonlight that survived in the darkness, and a dozen more I noticed I was going down a gentle slope. I kept moving forward, my heart slow and steady, my breath unhurried. No thought, no fear, just one foot in front of the other, hand trailing along the wall as a guide. A few minutes passed, and then I felt resistance. It was as if the air had suddenly grown thicker in front of me, an invisible membrane that worked against my passage. I pushed harder and was through, the air dropping suddenly from cold to freezing. It took me a moment to realize that I could see now. The air was suffused with a faint blue glow, a shining haze that gave just enough light to see what surrounded me. Bodies. 
hundreds of them, maybe more, given that they stretched out at corners out of sight, and possibly preserved and lined up in a fairly orderly fashion, a path wound between them, a scarred up strip of stone that led into the shadows. It was out of that darkness that mystery came crawling out to face me. Why are you here? The screeching whine was a blade of ice in my brain. Because I want to know what this is all for. Why you exist. Mystery stared up at me, her blue eyes blazing at me like a nightmare. Seconds passed as we stared at each other. My teeth gritted to stop them from chattering as I held my ground. Then finally, my why is unknown and unknowable. But if you wish to witness purpose, I will show you. I nodded. Yes. I want to know. As the last words left my mouth, Mystery stood. She rose like a magic trick, four legs sprouting impossibly from the tattered ruins of her flesh's end. In a breath she stood, a head taller than me, supported on four sickle moons of white bone. She moved forward and I felt my first stab of fear as I watched the tips of her ghastly limbs slicing into the stone beneath her as she moved along. Mystery came to stand over a nearby body, one that I recognized as a homeless woman I'd brought to her a few weeks ago. She crouched down slightly over the corpse, her eyes burning into me as a shadowy form snaked its way from between her legs. I was brought close to two memories at once. The first was of a scorpion killing a lizard on a nature show I saw once, striking it savagely with its tail. The second one was the time I saw my father naked. He was stepping out of the shower, his penis fully erect. She stabbed it into the dead woman's stomach. A few minutes passed as the thing shifted and pulsed, and then it withdrew, the terror had made in the flesh closing up behind its passage. It was like nothing had happened. And then I realized it wasn't true. The stomach was swollen now, the flesh tight and occasionally shifting almost imperceptibly, as if something inside had moved in its sleep. You've seen. Now go. The full flesh of fear had blossomed in my chest as I watched what mystery had done, and I ran back the way I came without questioning or looking back. Yet, in the second before I pressed back to the normal cold darkness of the cave, I noticed something. Most of the bodies I passed bore the same swollen, unnatural look, with whatever lay inside their body cavities, dreaming, restless dreams. Two weeks later, Sarah called me. Says the first time I've been back, you know? My breath had caught in my throat hearing her voice. She'd been nervously rambling for close to a minute, and I still didn't know what to say. I just came out to get some things I had put in storage, in and out in half a day. I never liked this place, not really. I only stayed all this time because of you. Yeah. Well, so I get here, right? And I'm not here an hour and I start wanting to call you. I can't stop thinking about you. Instead of leaving yesterday afternoon, I stayed the night at a bed and breakfast that wasn't here a year and a half ago. Well, you could have... I... I want to see you. I need to see you. I love you. I loved you so goddamn much. She was crying now, and when I said okay, I heard her drop the phone, a door slamming close by a few seconds later. It was good having her back. That first night, I never knew I could be that happy again. 
Every day she would talk about leaving to go back and settle all of her affairs, pack and move back so she could stay with me forever. But every day she would grow reluctant to leave me, even for a little while, and she would put it off for another day. On the fifth day after her return, I stared down into her beautiful blue eyes as we made love. My mind was calm and untroubled, and my heart was so full. So full. And then it came. Tribute. For a second it was a source of irritation, a chore that could wait a little while longer. Then I realized that it meant more than usual. This was a specific request. Tribute. I rolled away, running to the bathroom to be sick. I told Sarah after that I thought it was food poisoning and she seemed to believe me. Hours passed and then days. I didn't sleep from the worry and fear that filled every moment now. Periodically, mystery would repeat the word, the tone, if such a word could be applied to our communication, growing more insistent. I tried to ignore it. I tried to block out the growing roar that filled my head. After a week, I thought my head would burst from the pressure. And then it stopped. I felt relief, holding on to the dim hope that she had grown tired of badgering me and would pick someone else. I debated carrying her someone unprompted, but I was afraid to leave Sarah for long. And then, late one night, as Sarah lay softly snoring beside me, her head tucked into the crook of my arm, mystery spoke to me again. Her? Or you? I cried silently until the night slipped into the blue grays of morning, and then I got up and started packing. I had to get everything right. Everything had to be perfect. When Sarah woke up, we were ready. That day was beautiful, and despite the knowledge that I bore, it was a wonderful day for both of us. The picnic lunch I'd packed was delicious, which was a miracle given how inept I usually am in the kitchen, and Sarah... Sarah was happy. So beautiful, even after all those years. Just looking at her made me ache. That night I carried her inside, the sleeping pills I'd slipped into her dessert having taken her into a deep sleep. I lay her gently down on her bed, smoothing her clothes and brushing the hair from her face, looking at her one last time, giving her one final kiss. Then I went downstairs and unlocked the front door. I moved into the living room and sat in my chair, just out of view of the foyer. I waited. It was about 9.30 when I heard the handle turn and the door swing open. The strange sounds of mystery moving through the house, up my stairs, to my wife, and then quicker than seemed possible, the door had closed and shut again. Two days later, I thought I was dying. My brain was on fire, and I started bleeding from my ears and nose. If it had lasted three hours, I'm sure I'd have died. It only lasted two, and at the end, I found myself staring at the small ball and spur, that seed that mystery had given me the day that Roboter Parks died. Picking it out of the sink basin where I'd spit out in a glob of blood and gore, I absently wiped my face and hands on a nearby towel as I stumbled to bed. The last thing I remember is sitting the small piece of bone on my nightstand, thinking that I'd decide what it meant when I woke up. As it was, I slept for nearly a day, and when I woke up, the spur was gone. Weeks went by uneventfully. I kept to myself more than ever, staring out at the world that seemed more alien and hostile with me with each passing day. Something had changed when I lost Sarah. Something changed in me. Mystery hadn't asked for a tribute in months, but it would happen eventually. She always wanted more. 
Even if I couldn't really hear her anymore, I still knew her. She always had her need. Time was running out. If I was going to change things, if I was ever going to make things better, now was the time. So I started preparing. Tommy Jones was a fat kid, but he was smart and I liked him. He reminded me a lot of Everett and somewhat of myself as well. I first met him three months ago when he came around selling magazines for some school drive. When I'd first opened the door to reveal the red-faced 11-year-old boy, my first reaction was surprise. My house was a little off the beaten path, and I knew a lot of the town's children thought it was haunted. So I listened to his muttered sales pitch and ended up buying a couple of subscriptions, clearly surprising him. As I wrote the check out, wheels were turning, and as I handed it to him, I was smiling and inviting him in for something to drink. He looked nervous, the warnings of teachers and parents no doubt thundering in his ears, but I was still smiling at him and nodding, giving him the warm, friendly look that had made me so popular back when people mattered to me. After a moment's internal debate, he stepped inside, and after I ushered him in and got him the promised drink, we spent the next two hours just talking. And a remarkable thing happened. I had been so alone for so long that I'd forgotten what it felt like just to be around people. How good it felt to just talk, even if you were just talking about stupid little boy things. I would have listened to him rhapsodize about video games and who he thought they were. The king shit, sorry, crap, I guess. All day long, I thirsted for words, voices, noises that weren't my own. He came back a few days later and a few days after that, and his stories began to peter out, and then mine began. I told him about growing up in Tulsa County. I told him about the things I'd seen and the stories I'd heard. I told him the jokes that I would look up before he got there, just so I'd be entertaining enough. And of course, I told him about the cave. I saved the story for his fifth visit, and by that point, I truly liked Tommy. He was a good kid, and a smart kid. He got picked on at school some, but underneath he was strong-willed. His biggest strength, though, at least as far as I was concerned, was that he loved a good story. From the start, the legend of the cave fascinated him. At first, I kept it vague, only telling him a generalized version of the story that Everett had told us so many years before. Over time, I leavened it with more details, eventually admitting that, yes, I had been there before. And yes, the cave really did work. By that point, he was on his eighth visit, and he was desperate to know more. Where was it? How did it work? I was joking, right? Did it really work? He begged and begged for me to take him to the cave. So today, I did. We walked the trail that I had made from the house years before, the air hot and oppressive as we worked our way toward the clearing. My heart began to hammer as the drop-off came into view. I looked down at Tommy, and he looked both excited and scared. He was thrilled to touch something that had been a legend just a few weeks earlier, but he felt the wrongness of the place too. I felt a surge of fear that he would turn away, that he would not follow through, so I reminded him of what to do. I told him to get a rock, to write his question and tie the paper tight with the twine that I'd given him, and then when he was ready, to throw his question into the dark of the cave. He did as I asked, and when he was done, I crouched down before him, my smile genuine. He did good, Tommy. Real good. And we'll come back tomorrow for your answer, right? Tommy nodded, his eyes nervous but steady. Good. Now just remember, this place, this place is special. It's your place now, the secret place. I looked around the clearing before staring into the black below us. I thought I could just see two blue specks of light in the shadows. I turned back to the boy. It's a secret. Just for you.
Thank you to Absent Alice, Alice E, Amethyst, Amet, Caroline, Christina Smith, Deborah Tykus, Elizabeth Watkins, If in Doubt, Flat Out, Karen Parrott, Kat, Lindsay Pruitt, Melody Evans, Melissa Berwick, Myla, Nikki Parsons, Ray Clegg, The New On 24, Tiger Princess, and Victoria Step. If you're interested in getting a shout out and getting videos early, check out the Patreon and member links down in the description. And thanks again to everyone who supports what I do over here.